Um, my name is Angela Prediger, and I am the Associate Registrar here at Victoria College of Student Awards um, and Financial Aid. Welcome to Open Vic for our financial literacy and support session. I hope you've had uh, an opportunity uh, to watch the pre recorded information video on YouTube about tips for budgeting and financial resources prior to, day, to, prior to today, today's session. I understand that um, there were several hits on that video, so I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, if you have any questions about the material covered in the video, please send them to us in the chat so that we can answer them at the end of the session. So at this time, I am delighted to introduce and just thrilled that we have Ann Arbor here, a financial educator from the Credit Counseling Society, to give you information about money management. Following Ann's presentation, she and I, along with Jillian Yi Chang, who is our student awards officer here at Victoria College, will be here to answer your questions during the Q&A period. So again, please feel free to send us your questions in the chat. So now I'll turn things over to Anne. Welcome Anne and thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure and welcome to all the students and uh, thank you for organizing this. This is great. I, I won't take the drop off in numbers <laughs> personally, but um, yeah, today I hope everyone did get a chance to watch the video um, that Angela put up. It's really, really great information in terms of being able to figure out where your money, how to pay for all this. Um, and where the awards are at scholarships and funding and all of that, it's take advantage of the institution that you're going to be attending. There is such a wealth and depth of um, funding available. Ask questions, apply for everything. The worst thing that can happen is they say no. But so much money gets left on the table every year um, and it's available, make use of it and, uh, and do well. So the link to the, that uh, video is now in the chat. I'm going to share my screen right about now. And um, I will also make this available as a PDF. So I will um, send that to the registrar's office. So if anyone needs a copy of it, but again, this is all being, um, recorded so you should be having a call you should be good what i want to talk today about is and i'm coming to this as a financial educator as um, a parent of three post-secondary students mostly finished one still going through there um, and i've talked to kids my own kids my their friends places uh, other post-secondaries where i do presentations and this comes down to what are some of the things you wish you'd known? What are the good things to know now before you get started? Um, and we'll get going with that. One sec, as soon as my system decides it wants to wake up. There we go. Um, just for a very quick bit of background in terms of the Credit Counseling Society, so you know where this information is coming from. We're a registered nonprofit um, agency. We serve five provinces and two territories, and we have a very simple mandate, which is to help, to educate, and to give hope. We prevent, present neutral information. We don't lend any money. We don't sell anything. We give information and options. So we provide free um, and confidential credit and budget counseling, and we have a lot of post-secondary students. We're right down the street from U of T. We're at the corner of Bloor and Sherburne. Um, uh, is the Toronto office uh, and we also have a full education program and I'll mention some of those webinars and other things that are available as you go along. Um, you know it's so interesting just to give you an idea in 2018 we took about 74,000 calls from Canadians with questions about their money and debt and credit and those kinds of things in 2019 that was 83,000 and we didn't open any new offices so money is something that affects everyone at some point in their life um, and it's really important I think some of the reasons why we see people you can see the obvious ones but number four people just don't learn about it and I was pleased to see the 
potential change in the Ontario math curriculum coming up. But in the meantime, you're starting a new chapter of your life and it's really important to get some of this information under your belt. And you'll hear the expression lifelong learning quite a bit. This is all part of it as well. Please, any questions you have, definitely by all means, you make use of the chat. So we'll keep an eye on that. And again, as Angela mentioned, there are going to be questions at the end. Um, so we can cover those off. But, you know, you're about to enter university. It's a very exciting time. It's also, I know it's under very different circumstances than you'd originally anticipated. Really important to know that financial stress is a piece of this too. Um, one in three students reports that finances are very or tremendously stressful. And at some point in your post-secondary education, you'll take a stats class um, and you'll understand that very and tremendously in sampling language is pretty extreme. That's like, you know, nine, 10, 11 on a one out of 10 scale. And you really wanna be able to focus on your studies. So being able to get some of the financial practices under your belt and good habits over the summer so that you can hit the ground running in September, being able to focus on your studies and really thrive um, at Vic, which would be great. It's very exciting. So some of the things that I wanted to um, talk about were, and I want to pick up where Angela left off. So though you know, in terms of how to manage your monthly spending and saving, how to just your day-to-day -day money make that work for you. Um, you're going to be a great target market for all kinds of credit card companies. So um, if you do, or when you do get a credit card, understanding how that works, that's my goal by the end of the session. There's a lot of chit chat about um, credit score. So I want you to be able to understand what that is all about. Sorry, my fan is making some kind of weird noise, so hopefully that will go off. Um, understanding credit score and what all the hullabaloo around that is. Having some idea if you are taking advantage of student loans, um, I know you're just getting started, but it's always good to have the end in mind and understanding what repayment of those loans might look like, um, just to give you some shape around that so you don't ignore those and you know when you're set up for when it comes time um, and also where to get some help when a lot of this becomes overwhelming because there is so much help available you don't have to do this on your own and lots of resources both within the university and outside as well to give you a hand so logically we're going to talk about all these things as we go we'll talk about tracking and budgeting we're going to talk about savings we're going to talk about credit cards and scores debts and where to get some help the first thing I hear so often is how do I just manage my money? There are a lot of expenses coming your way, new expenses that up till now, maybe your parents have looked after, maybe you've looked after it, but not on this scale. This might, it's likely the first time in your life you're really looking after your own money. And especially when you're getting lumps of payments, if you're using OSAP or anything like that, you're getting these chunks of money and you need to make it last over a period of time. So what's the best way to do that? Typical expenses, and this was covered in the other video too, for sure, obviously tuition, books, fees, and books now, I'm using air quotes, because in a lot of cases it's going to be online access and um, the cost of the books afterwards. There are housing costs, um, residents, if not in first year, certainly second year, are you renting a place with a bunch of other people downtown? Are you renting your own place? What does that look like? Because it's the rent, it's the utilities, the carrying costs, all of that. Food and groceries. Um, you know, are you packing a lunch every day and coming downtown? Are you living on campus? What's happening there? I always want to do another workshop called Life After Meal Plan, and I can teach everybody to cook. Um, phone your lifeline, right? And internet, depending, um, I would say, take as much advantage of the university Wi-Fi as you possibly can. How are you getting to school? If you're living off campus, um, transit, 
whether that's GO or TTC, are you driving? Then there's parking passes and all those things. Um, you know, occasionally you'll be able to have a little fun. So Toronto is a great city. And once we fully open back up, being able to take advantage of some of those things that downtown has to offer um, and just your own personal thing. So there are lots of different expenses you can see. And it's really important to know where's your money going? What are you spending your money on? And this is a great habit if to start developing over the summer because this is the secret sauce to making it all work. Tracking your expenses. And tracking is going to tell you the truth because we're all human. So think about maybe the last time you bought a gift for somebody and or you know you bought something for yourself and you decided you went out to Amazon and you had in mind a budget of $25, okay? You were looking maybe for a phone case. Found something and it was $23.99. That's amazing, you're totally on budget, right? Great, so in your head you spent $24, you're on budget and off you go. But when it comes time and your credit card bill arrives, there's going to be sales tax and potentially delivery charges and maybe some other charge. So, cause you needed it right away. So you rushed it. That $24 item that you think you were in budget is probably closer to a $32 item when all is said and done. So the reality between what we think and what the numbers show, there's often a disconnect. Tracking is going to tell you the truth with that. So important to keep track of the coffees and the lunches and the odds and the ends and the visit to the dollar store and all those little things that add up. So it tells you the truth and tracking also shows you your habits. So if you're running short or feeling a little tight or a great trip comes up for reading week and you wanna go skiing with your friends, but you need to find a little money, what parts of your budget can you cut? So it shows you your habits and where you can make some, where there are some opportunities to make some changes um, and where other areas that might need a little bit of attention. It's about being in control. And when there are other things like schedule, exam schedules and papers and all kinds of other things that are out of your control, it helps to have to know that your money is, is working tight for you. It's also, there's so many different ways to um, track. I'll go back to that. There are most financial institutions have apps. Um, there are third party apps that just have to be careful about one or two bits on those and somebody can remember to ask me in the question section what you need to be careful with. Um, pen and paper, we've got a, down, uh, a tracking booklet you can download, you can use a spreadsheet, entering your receipts. Some people just track anything under $50 because they'll remember everything over and maybe it's fixed costs. You don't, you know, you know your rent every month, you know your um, cell phone bill, those kinds of things. So really important to keep track. Just find a system that works for you and start with one or two categories and build up from there. You can't learn the whole textbook in one night. You can't cram this, you'll burn out. Start slowly, bit by bit, and build up the habit and build up the muscle memory for tracking, and then it will just become part of your life. And it's so valuable, especially when budgets are really tight and you need to make, let's say, your OSAP payment last through the whole term until the next payment comes, those kinds of things. Also having a budget, and it's not a super sexy word, I know, and it's boring and it feels very adult and it feels very restrictive and there are limitations and you have to say no to yourself and all those things. But really it's just a spending plan. You have, presumably you're gonna have an agenda and, and a study schedule, this is part of your schedule too. It's a dynamic process because you can write out all your expenses that you think or that you've learned through tracking, but then something changes, groceries go up, or maybe you have a great opportunity to move in with somebody else and all of a sudden your utility expenses are cut. So things change month to month to month. So your budget is a dynamic document that you wanna be able to keep coming back to. Um, based totally on your own choices and your own priorities, I, you know, could very well spend more on ice cream and peanut butter than most people, but those are my priorities. So you just have to make sure that you've got some form of document, whether it's again on a computer, whether it's in a notebook, whatever works for you. And we've got um, a great interactive online budget builder at mymoneycoach.ca. And I will give references to all those during the questions as well, um, where you can go in and save different scenarios. 
So if you want the scenario, if you're not working, if maybe you are able to find a part-time job, do all those different kinds of things. What does your living situation look like? And you'll change that every year. In terms of managing your own money on a regular basis, sort of day to day, this is different because you're not getting, you know, I am fortunate I get a paycheck every two weeks, so I can budget it accordingly. You're likely getting lumps of money um, from OSAP, you know, twice a year, potentially some money from a part-time job, maybe from family, those kinds of things. You want to create your own, you're your own small business. So you've got money coming in and you want to create different accounts and there are ways to, as students, you are charged fees for accounts um, and there are other places to get accounts where you won't be charged fees. Making sure you set almost an allowance and I don't, you know, I want to use that word in a positive way that you're taking out the same, you allot yourself the same amount of money each month and the rest of the money is going to your fixed expenses. So those will be rent, living, those kinds of things. For the once in a while expenses, you're setting things aside like tuition and books, lab fees, those kinds of things. Um, and then your variable. So your groceries, your entertainment, your transportation, those kinds. Um, and for the visual learners. So all the money comes into your holding account. You take out the same amount each month and allot it to the expenses that are the same every month, to the ones that happen every month but are different, like groceries and transportation and entertainment and personal care, and then into savings to be set aside for the bigger things that come up over time. Number two is how can I save money while I'm in school? It feels like a lot of money's going out the door, and it is likely, but they're also opportunities and this was mentioned in Angela's video as well lots of ways to save every little bit counts you're on student budget so there's lots of every, my favorite way in business school was we had a lot of companies coming in to do presentations um, for recruiting and things like that and there was always food yeah so go to anything where they're going to feed you. That's the first one. Um, but you can do on your debit cards, if you use debit cards quite a bit, a rounding up feature or a topping up feature. So, you know, back in the day when we used actual cash, if I bought lunch and it was $5.45, I would give the cashier $6 and they would give me 55 cents change and I would, you know, put it in my pocket and then in a jar at the end of the day. With a rounding up feature, it does the same thing. You can ask your bank or um, credit union to do this. And it, when you tap, it will debit $6 even. It will give $5.45 to the place where you're buying your food and then put for your 55 cents change into a savings account for you. And it's just a great way to let spare change add up. And it also makes your tracking super easy because everything's an even number. <laughs> It's just dollars. Um, so the rounding up is a great way to trick yourself into doing a little bit of savings as you go. Setting up any bills, as many bills as you can on automatic transfer, an automatic payment, and having money transferred a little bit each month to savings. The less we touch our own money, the better, the less likely we are to, um, to spend it as we go. There are all kinds of rebate apps available. If you've used, I've heard of Rakuten. So if you're doing any online shopping, um, you are paid, it's, it's um, market research. So you use Rakuten as the gateway to get to the online store that you're going to, and you receive um, a commission, a rebate, a certain percentage, and they have different promotions at different times. Um, you know, set a challenge with a friend. There's something called the 52 week money challenge. You can Google that and I'll explain it later, but over time you'll save money each week in increasing amounts. Um, and you can put that into uh, an emergency savings account, something like that. Um, loyalty programs, you know, uh, the PC optimum, uh, you know, any of these programs where there are just be intentional with it and be focused and don't, be swayed to spend money you weren't intending to spend. Make these programs work for yourself. Um, there are also tons of student discounts, like tons. And Angela mentioned the SBC card uh, in her video. And it's a great way to save money. And I know people say, well, it's only 5% or it's this. Or 
that stuff adds up over time or it's an extra coffee or an upsized or whatever it is every little bit really does count and when you're counting your your nickels it's important um, as i say all campus events where they're going to serve you and university classifieds are such a great way to find or um, facebook marketplace any of these places to find furniture to find textbooks to find other resources that you need and um, you know much more environmentally friendly too to keep reusing and recycling as we go credit cards you are in the sweet spot for the credit card companies and it's really exciting you're now an adult you are over 18 or almost 18 and when you get that first credit card it can feel like wow i have all this extra money i need you to remember that by definition credit is using someone else's money to buy something a service a product something we um need something we want something we didn't plan for like an emergency but you're using someone else's money with the promise to pay that back and it's usually with interest so um the thing i hear you really need to learn how to use credit wisely we have a webinar called the truth about credit where um, I cover everything I'm going to cover in the next sort of four minutes in over an hour. Um, so I encourage you to take a peek at that over the summer as well. But I just very quickly, and please be prepared on the chat to give me your answer. You know, it's very easy in the first couple of months, you're in downtown Toronto, there's some great stores, you want to decorate your room, um, you've got to pick up, pay some tuition, you've got to pick up some books, you need some new school clothes, you need a new backpack, you got to look good, right? And I know it's a little different this coming semester, but trust me, the, the pressure to will, will hit. It's very easy, you know, to put $3,000 on a credit card. Um, it is, at, let's say this credit card is at 19.9%, so a pretty basic credit card. Every credit card comes with a minimum monthly payment. There's this whole agreement where, of course, you owe them $3,000, but they're so kind and generous, they're not asking for the full three at the end of the month. You just need to pay a small bit of it to keep things rolling. Um, you know, it could be 2%, it could be 3%. That's important to know the terms and conditions of your individual card because they will all be a little bit different. But this one is 2%, so $60. How long, and I'd love to know on the chat here, smart kitties, what, uh, how long do you think it would take to pay off $3,000, 2% at a time at 20% interest? Um, and while the guesses are coming in, I'd love to know what, what we think. Um, I will just tell you again, really, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, Sonia, thank you. If you, anyone want to quantify what's going on, <laughs> that's great. I'm putting that in my answers next time. Um, the reality is, again, every, uh, lots of credit card companies are just asking for $10. They're not even asking for the 60. Um, all right you know normally yeah right so you do you do the math three thousand divided by 60 divided by 12 months add a little bit of interest five years thanks shelby anyone else i feel like um you know what an auction i have a bit of five years do we have anything else don't be shy okay i'm going to blow your minds for a minute yeah i love doing this in person because i usually get the <gasps> Oh, accurately incorporating the APR. That is an excellent question. I'm impressed you know what APR is. Um, it's the annual prescribed rate, but also it's, you know, this is simple interest. A lot of the financial institutions are now compounding the interest. So these numbers get even worse. But honestly, $3,000 will take you, if you just pay the minimum, just to keep your head above water, 53 years almost. You're 18 years old. Do you want to be carrying, thinking about that backpack or those dinners on Bloor Street for the next 53 years? And it will have cost you more than four times the amount of the original stuff that is long gone. You've got so much else, that's a lifetime, right? So what happens if we increase? We're gonna talk about, I'll answer that question as we go, hopefully. Um, 
but just keep in mind that you know if you go to seventy dollars instead of the sixty you're down to sixteen years still a really long time almost your entire lifetime at this point but look at the interest it's just it's about one and a half times and if you can make that payment a hundred and twenty dollars you're down to just about three years so and significantly less interest at the end of the day credit is a tool and I'll show you some of the reasons why it's a good tool, but it's very easily, you know, it's like chocolate. It's a great thing, but a little too much of it can be an issue. Um, you have to know the terms and conditions. Ideally, you only spend and you have a plan, you only spend money that you know you have and that you'll be able to pay at the end of the month because it's convenient, right? Um, or there's cash back involved some, in some cases, or there are reward, you know, you have to make, again, the system work for you, rewards, those kinds of things. If you are in, and sometimes in your life, you will have to carry a balance. And if you do, the thing to keep in mind is that every dollar over and above that minimum payment will save you decades and thousands in interest. So if you're in a position where you have to carry a balance because it was an emergency or unplanned, um, just everything you've got extra that you can put onto it will save you in the long run that's you know just be aware because it sounds great like sure borrow this money but just pay us back as you can as you go it's okay be aware of really what those numbers look like and as i say as more and more financial institutions start compounding the interest those numbers get significantly worse so again don't spend money you don't have always planning for that full repayment know those terms and conditions and please avoid any unnecessary fees on your bank accounts on your credit cards by going over limit any of that stuff it's great that they let you go i don't think it's great i think they should stop it but they're like yeah i know you had a limit but we'll let you go over but we're going to charge you another 50 dollars like just be super careful with what it is it's a tool that can be very helpful, but it can also be very dangerous. Tied into credit score, or cred, tied into credit card is something called credit score. That's been getting a ton of great marketing lately. And a lot of people wanna know what is credit score and how do I get a good one? I wanna take a step back from there and look at credit reports first. So there's a lot of language, there's credit bureau, there's credit report, there's credit rating, there's credit score. They're all something different. And it starts from a place of a credit report um, that is, you know, you need like a resume to get a job or you get a report card or you'll get your transcripts from school. A credit report is like your report card with money. It's like your resume. So with borrowing. Um, you need some kind of reputation. For me to hire you, I need to see a list of your previous experience and skills. For me to lend you money as a creditor, and I was a banker for a long time, I need to know, are you a good risk? What has been your experience before? Have you borrowed from other places and have you paid them back? And when they say pay them back, they're really looking at minimum payments. You now know that you want to pay more than the minimum payment, but in their minds, a minimum payment will give you a decent report. So it's your detailed history of your credit behavior over a number of years. You're just starting. Some kind institution will give you a starter credit card, and then they'll give you more rope and more rope and more rope and see how far out of the yard you can get with it. Um, so you're just starting to build your credit report, your credit ratings and your scores. The credit report, very much like a resume, you know, starts off with your personal information. It's got some information on who's making inquiries, like where have you applied for credit, all those things. But the meat of it are the ratings. And these are like your grades in school. Each creditor, so each credit card company or the car financing company or the cell phone company will give you, and even OSAP at some point, will give you a rating. Are you operating that credit as agreed? Um, so there are different letters associated with different kinds of credit, which is really just to categorize them and organize them. So when another lender is looking, they know, you know, revolving is a credit card because you've got a limit. Sometimes you use some of it, all of it. It's up and down and up and down or going around and around. An installment loan would be like a car loan where you borrow a chunk 
um, of money and you're paying it back each month at the same amount also like your student loans those kinds of things and open would be something like a cell phone um, contract where you don't really have a limit you can use as much as you want but you still owe them money and then the meat of it are the numbers so if you've ever heard um, language like O oh, and R9, if you do something, you get a nine or a one, you want to be a one. And what that means really is just you're paying as agreed. Each month you make at least your minimum payment or more, but you're going to make more now because you know, um, and you're just paying on or before the due date. And I'm going to give you a real insider tip. You can pay your bill before the due date. So many people wait to the last minute. You don't have to wait. You can pay your bill. You know, you can wait till a day or two before. But I would say, you know, automate your payments and make them a couple of days before the due date, just in case there's a system issue or it's over a weekend or, you know, all those kinds of things. You don't want to run into any trouble and extra fees. So the slower and later and later you are, the longer, the lower or the higher the number gets. So you want to be a one. Zero means it's too new. They've just given you the credit. There's no history. You're just kind of dating and they have, you haven't committed yet to the relationship or they haven't committed to you yet. Um, I don't know why there's no six, but there is no six. That is a mystery that in my 30 years in financial services, I still don't know the answer. And I actually asked somebody at one of the credit bureaus and she doesn't know either. So what you're really concerned about are your credit ratings. You want to make sure those are solid. There's also something, yeah, that could be a good, that could be a reason. I think they were just holding it. I think it's one of those things where they were like holding it back in case another category came up. I, I really, I don't even know. Um, in terms of your credit score, this is an extra piece. This is another way to categorize and it's another way for a, um, a creditor to evaluate you. And it's a three digit number from 300 to 900. In this case, the higher the better. Um, 900 is a bit of a unicorn. Apparently you can get there, but you can get really close to it. But your score changes all the time. And depending where you get your score from, it will be different. It's a bit of an inexact, well, it is an inexact sign but it is a good benchmark to know where you are and where you're starting. At this stage of the game, you are building your credit score. You don't, it's not, you know, you're not purchasing real estate. You're not, presumably, you're not doing a lot, borrowing a lot that way, but it's good to start to build your credit footprint so that if, as and when, in the years to come, you want to do something more substantial, that you do have a good reputation, a good footprint. Credit score isn't as huge a deal here yet as it is in the States, but it's becoming. Um, there is, uh, you can get, I'll, I'll reference the where to do the webinars in the, in the question section, just remind me please. Um, uh, you can get your credit score for free from a number of different places. You just want to be careful. So depending where you bank, if you bank, I know Royal Bank and Scotiabank, um, it's on their app. You can get your credit score, but it's not something you need to be checking every 10 minutes. It's one of these things you want to check, you know, once a year to know where you are. Um, and most people eventually, like the B plus of credit scores, like the thing that's going to get you through school, the thing that will get you through credit is to have a 650 or better. 650 is the benchmark that most lenders use to give you published rates, to give you like good rates. You can get a car, you can get a loan with a much lower rate, a uh, lower score, but it's going to be really expensive because it's not a, a mainstream loan. There'll be, there's more risk to it for the lender. Um, so just be careful where you're getting your information. If you go to CBC Marketplace, it's a, a TV show that's on. I think it was back in December. They did a, if you just Google CBC Marketplace credit score, they have a great 12 minute video that breaks it down. There's really good information there and um, I can send a link to that as well after. But, you know, people get all worried about their credit score and start altering their behavior to try and engineer it. 
It is an extremely complicated, complex algorithm. It is, you can drive yourself around the bend trying to engineer it. At the end of the day, this is as simple as I can make the representation, but it's important to know what goes into it. The biggest piece, 35% of the calculation is binary. It's, are you paying your bills on time? That's a yes or a no. That's easy to automate so that you never miss a payment. This is very easy to engineer 35% of your score and not have to think about it. Another almost a third is the amount owed. Is it in line with your resources? What's your exposure? Some people like to say, oh, I've got you know all these credit cards, but I never use them. It's still exposure. It's still potential that everything, you know, you could have four credit cards with $10,000 limits and you're not using a thing, but you could have a bad day tomorrow and come home with a whole lot of, you know, gaming systems or purses and shoes, whatever it is. So it's still risk to the lender. So making sure that you only have as much credit as you can logically with your resources handle. So you don't want to have too much temptation and too much risk and too much exposure. And the other bits and pieces, you know, that play into it are the length of credit history. So I actually have my credit card from when I was 18, a thousand years ago, it was made of stone. Um, but I keep that open with a really small limit. That's the one I use online because the length of history, it's been there forever. So it really helps my credit score. You're just starting you'll build those lengths, those accounts and the stability, um, you know, but resist the temptation to switch cards every six months just for the next best deal. There's always going to be a next best deal. It's fine. So just being aware that what your credit score is, it's that three digit number. And you just want to make sure that you're behaving in a way that you're paying your bills on time and you're not taking on too much. You're not applying for every card under the sun because they're offering you a Frisbee or a water bottle. Right? There are going to be plenty of water bottles and t-shirts in your life. Um, it's all very tempting, but just keep in mind that 66% or 65%, two-thirds almost, of this equation is under your control. So that's credit score. Things that don't build credit are things like debit cards, like Visa debit or MasterCard de um, debit MasterCards, because that's your money. It's got that branding of a credit card on it, but it's a debit. So it appears like a credit card online and allows you to do those things, but it's really your money. You don't, you're not borrowing anyone's money and offering and promising to pay it back. Same thing with prepaid cards or prepaid cell phones. It's, there's no debt being incurred there um, and payday loans as well. Things you can do, as I mentioned, pay your bills on time, ideally pay it in full every single month. Um, you can use a secured credit card, which is uh, a card where you are giving them an amount of money to hold and um, using the card and they've got the security that if something went wrong, they could pay it. That's a different um, way. A cell phone contract is a great way to start to build credit. Not the prepaids, but the contracts. Those companies report very quickly to the credit bureau, which I'll talk about very quickly, um, but make sure that you're making those payments because what can help you build credit can also hurt you. If you don't make the payments, they can report very quickly. And you don't need to buy a lot. You can just use the card once in a while. Um, I know people who have put their cell phone payment through their credit card and then pay the credit card. So every month something's going through and it helps build their credit like that. There are two agencies you can get your credit score and your credit reports from. Your credit report is free once every 12 months from each of these two agencies. Um, I can put the slide back up again during the, the question period, but again, you can Google Equifax or TransUnion. Um, your scores will be different from each agency because, and you have to pay for it to get from these two agencies. It's about $20 after tax. Um, they'll be different because they use slightly different calculations and they take into account different things, but it gives you a good starting point. Another thing that comes up um, and with students that I talk to a lot is the question of how do I pay back these student loans? 
like I know I'm going to have to eventually and I see the balance is going up up each year what do I do and how do I handle it uh, as Angela mentioned in her video with student loans you graduate tassel goes to the other side of the mortar board and the clock starts you don't have to make on certain portion there's federal and there's provincial on the provincial portion you don't have to make a payment for the first six months they the thinking is to let you graduate take your time find a job and then the, the interest clock starts but the payments don't start until the seventh month somewhere in that period so to land on your feet get a job and you know start saving some money up within that period you'll get a letter from the government and it will or from the national student loan center so you set up your account you can go in it will give you different payment options you have to select one if you ignore that it doesn't make the debt go away all that does is it makes the government pick an option for you and rest assured they will likely pick the most expensive option if you are unsure about the options that have been presented national student loan center i have found over the years has become better and better and better at their customer service they can explain it to you you can go to your financial aid office to the registrar there are lots of resources on campus to help you you can come to us you can go to a trusted you know financial institution there are lots of people and places to help you figure out what these different payment options look like um, but it's really important that you don't ignore it and you you can change your mind you're not locked into certain things you can change it but just pick one that you think will work um, and go from there there's there are certain concessions that have been made um, because of covid certainly um, but those hopefully <laughs> will not still be in place by the time you're graduating um, and it's important to know I think what happens if after those six months you can't make any payments and you're not working or you've done other things, there are programs, uh, repayment assistance programs to help you. And again, you can find all that out through the National Student Loan Center. Um, what's interesting to note, depending what field you're going into, is there are special repayment assistance programs for people who are or graduates who are working in the nonprofit center. Uh, sector excuse me and also graduates who are taking on taking an entrepreneurial bent um, on the understanding that you might not be earning as much as somebody who's working you know in a high-rise banking tower downtown um, so there are different concessions that they can make just to help lessen the payment each month you still ultimately are responsible it's not a loan forgiveness but it's so showing some flexibility um, in helping you repay those things so that's a really great valuable resource even as you're going through school um, if you make any changes in your program if you go from full-time to part-time your eligibility might change um, if you go on to grad school if you decide to take a break all those kinds of things so the that phone number and that website um, all through your schooling if you're using uh, OSAP are very important when you're looking at repayment strategies just keep in mind um, again this is a bit early I understand but you want it in the back of your head in terms of how you're going to handle it and you know for any debts there are two ways to to handle things either paying the highest interest rate first or the lowest balance first um, and you know let's say you have a set amount of money that you want to be able to put towards your debts depending on you know what kind what the debt is and again there are people who can help you prioritize and strategize but you want to be making the minimum payments across all of your debts to make sure everything is kept up to date but then putting the extra resources onto the highest interest rate one even if it's the biggest balance because presumably that will save you money in the long run if you want to start on the lowest balance and make the most impact and get rid of one really quickly that's where the money goes and when that one is paid all those resources go on to the next one and the next one so everything's being kept current but you're putting all your extra power and focusing on one at a time the last question we have 
is where can I get help? And I did mention there are lots of places to get help, but it's really important to understand as you are taking on these greater responsibilities, you're looking after your own money, you are starting to take on loans and debts that you never had before, um, you know, and potentially credit card. What's, what's the impact? Like what happens if I don't take these lessons to heart? I mentioned before how stressful money stress can be and how it can impact your academic performance. You've worked hard. You're attending University of Toronto. You're in Vic College. Like you're clearly smart and capable, um, but there's a stress that goes along with maintaining that kind of performance. So you've gone, you're going from your high school into a big institution. Um, where do you want to put your emotional energy? And you want to take finances, that stress off of your shoulders so you can focus on, on really enjoying this experience to the fullest. Um, so you don't want debt, worries, and pressures to be affecting your studies. You also don't want it to affect your career prospects uh, over the summers and also after graduation. If you really want to end up in not-for-profit and you have you know, a real clear direction. If you've got debt on your shoulders, you might be feel forced to take a job, a corporate job that isn't, doesn't speak to you and isn't part of your path, but because you've got these debts to pay. So having a plan and having really good financial um, practices all the way through and building these habits now can help keep those paths clear for you so you can really follow the path that you want, or maybe again, entrepreneurial, maybe you want to start your own business, do something like that, or work in a startup or take a year off or whatever it's going to be. Don't let debt be the thing that holds you back from those dreams. Um, and your life after graduation too, you know, craft dinner and sleeping on a mattress on the floor is great while you're in school, but you know, after a while, you might want to get a real but um, the other thing and reason to have good credit is it's going to, you know, other people are looking at it. So yes, it's for you to be able to, you know, eventually maybe you need to finance a car or do something like that, but it's also going to affect your housing options, especially in a competitive city like Toronto, landlords are looking at credit scores um, after a certain point, you know, um, they want to know that you're a good risk and you're responsible and you're going to pay your rent every month and they don't have to chase you. Some employers are going to also take a quick look. Um, my employer, I'm teaching you about money. My employer, with my permission, of course, nobody can check your credit history or scores without your permission, uh, your written permission. But my employer needed to see that my life was in order and that I wasn't a complete mess behind the scenes because I'm teaching you about this stuff. Um, and also, as I say, future borrowing opportunities. So if you want to go on to grad school and you're going to need a, a you know, more significantly higher loans to do that kind of thing, um, and maybe student lines of credit, not within the OSAP world, but within a bank, things like that. So there are all these pieces of your future that will be impacted and you want to make sure you have your practices in line. Um, but as I say, with all of that, if it should become overwhelming, but in an effort to make it not become overwhelming, is definitely taking advantage. There's so many, I mean, this, this webinar and this whole day um, is a great example that at the college, the resources are there and available to you um, and very approachable. So go knock on a door, make a phone call, send an email, send, I'm, if there's chat, uh, and ask the questions because if they don't have the answers, they will point you in the right direction. Um, and that's what this college system is so lovely because you've got this home within this greater institution and they can send you in all the right directions. And there are so many resources at the university. Um, again, finding out your, there, thank you, Angela finding out, uh, speaking to financial institutions, and it doesn't have to be yours. You can make a phone call and oh, to any of these, their toll-free numbers and ask questions. And there are websites um, that have information and lots of voices. 
and a nonprofit credit counselor. Again, whether it's my organization or a different one, you know, you want to make sure that they're accredited, that it isn't just somebody who just said, oh, sure, I know about money, let me help you. Um, you want to make sure that they're licensed, that they're accredited, um, that they've got really good reviews, that they're neutral, that they're not charging you any fees, that it's confidential, all those kinds of bits and pieces. Um, just to be able to ask questions. And as I say, we have all kinds of students in school and just about to graduate that we help on a regular basis. Um, you know, your budgets will change and all those kinds of things. So, you know, congratulations. This is a really exciting time. I know it's under very different circumstances, as I say, that you'd anticipated, and I understand that. Um, I've got quite a few people in my life who are, are in the same boat. Um, but I think it's going to be a great interview question in a job interview when they ask you, you know, tell me about a time you faced adversity, how you, you know, they want to know about resiliency. Um, this is it. So, you know, you've no prom and no graduation and you're entering university during these kinds of times. But your education at the end of the day is an investment in you and your life and your, your future. So, yes, it could mean taking on bigger debt and big responsibilities at a young age, but know that it's for a definite purpose and building those skills now will pay dividends, pun fully intended, uh, in the future as you move along. So I've thrown a lot at you and we're going to have some time to ask a lot of questions. And just to circle back, remember we talked about just managing your month to month, your day to day spending um, and some opportunities for saving. And that's through keeping track of your spending every, uh, just I want to haunt you with that like make sure that you know where your money is going and you can even set aside a little bit of it for the stuff that doesn't have to be tracked you know if it's ten dollars in your pocket or ten dollars that's just fun money that you don't track but you're tr you know but you know that you've set that aside those kinds of things um, really learning how to use a credit card responsibly and that does take some practice. So taking those lessons to heart, understanding about a credit score we talked about, um, with also about student loans in the future with an eye to making sure you understand what the implications and how you're going to handle them afterwards uh, and where to go to get some help all the way through. Now, midway and at the end. Um, have I mentioned tracking? <laughs> Um, you can request your own credit reports, as I mentioned, from those agencies and start mapping out some budgets and seeing what those look like and try them now and see how that goes like a dress rehearsal. You've got a couple of months. So take the time now to practice so that you can figure out where any pain points are and um, and get get over those bumps before school starts and just stay with it and focus on school and have a really, really, really great time. Enjoy it all. And uh, thank you for joining. I know we've got lots of questions, so we'll take a look at those. Um, and just a, a quick, I will point you towards mymoneycoach.ca. And that's where you can find the calendar of webinars, which includes the truth about credit and um, and a whole load, load of other topics, but that one's a really great one to just build out what I was talking about here. And um, if you need any more, we're all over social media. You're welcome to leave a Facebook review, um, follow us, there are all kinds of good posts that go up pretty much every day. And if you need any more help, that's our number. Um, and I can give, I'll give my email address in the chat if anyone has any I can do a lot of things and talk at the same time but typing is not one of them okay that's me if anyone has any questions yeah canada.ca has some great uh, tools as well thanks Jillian okay so that is it for me I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, and head back to Angela Thank you, Anne. Um, that was a very, very detailed presentation, and I'm sure our incoming students appreciated learning about the different aspects of money 
uh, management as they prepare for the start of their university career. So I'm, I'm really pleased that we were able to, to present this joint session, um, which is very, very important. So thank you. Um, I will now share, we'll move forward and we'll move uh, uh, on to the Q&A. Um, and I will just share uh, my screen right now. And I'll just ask the questions. And Jillian Yi Chang, who's our student awards officer, and Anne are here to help answer the questions. So I'll just uh, share my screen and we'll move forward. How's that? Sounds good to me. Okay. Okay, can, can everyone see that? Yeah. Can we see that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so now we need to look at the chat. Here we go. I'm, I'm talking my, my way through this now. Here we go. Sorry about that. Don't worry. I'm having problems with. Do you want me to read them out? Yeah. Do you mind? Because I'm having difficulties with um, the chat here. Yeah, not at all. So Jillian, um, back at the beginning, posted that YouTube. So I hope everyone watches that. Um, someone was asking, uh, do we get some sort of scholarship if we get really good grades in our high school IB program? Um, I'm an international student without a scholarship. So just wondering if we automatically get it or are we required to apply for it? Jillian, I think that's your Jillian. <laughs> Hi there. Hi, everyone. Um, so we wanted to um, let everyone know that um, all admission scholarship offers have already been um, assessed and um, sent out. So students who qualified um, would have been notified at the time of admission and uh, you would be checking your join uh, U of T portal um, if you had qualified. Um, so most students were notified back in March and April already um, by this time. So um, um, at this point, um, I'm sorry if you um, didn't hear right at this time, um, just be aware that once you're registered here at uh, Victoria College at U of T, you can, as a high standing, you know, academically high performing student, you can still qualify for in-course awards that are automatic um, but at the end of your first, second, and third year of studies. So we know that there's a lot of high achievers out there, but um, we just um, have limited funds at the, at the University of Advec to award every single student with high standing um, with an award. And it is quite competitive every single year. We are astounded at the amount of students in the high, you know, in the high 90s, mid 90s, all of these that, um, that we see every year that comes across um, our admission cycle. Okay, but I think that, you know, that there are, it isn't, this isn't your only chance that through the years there are opportunities and also bursaries and those kinds of things. Exactly. That's great. Yeah, and there's that awards portal now, the U of T wide. Can we give the link to that maybe? Um, I'll send that um, in the chat. So if you're referring the to the awards prof yeah. profile, um, this is the additional information that the U of T had asked um, applicants to um, provide to the university for uh, very specific awards that have, um, you know, certain criteria depending on financial need or a certain uh, uh, heritage or background. Um, so uh, some, I think Maggie had mentioned in her question about um, whether those students have been notified um, on the uh, uh, U of T website for future.utano.ca. Um, mentioned that the decisions were made back in or the end of May. So I believe those decisions may have already been sent out throughout this month. Um, students had up until June 1st to accept their admission to the university. So I'm sure that um, Central U of T had to um, you know, figure out who's, who's actually coming before matching up um, the recipients to these particular awards. Right, it does take time. Because um, there, there is a question from uh, about I remember U of T wanted to start an Iranian Memorial Scholarship. Is that still happening? 
So actually, I responded to Bonjana privately, but there is a link to this particular um, scholarship. It did start and was um, launched in the spring of this year, and um, it's, it's needs-based. And um, the question, I mean, students right now may be researching these at a you know, newly admitted um, point, but the, the criteria may be very specific and open only to currently registered undergraduate students. So I recommend that um, you guys uh, email awards at you of t at utano.ca just to get clarification on some of these opportunities right. and i put that link in the chat julian great perfect thank you oh right i see that okay i'm, I'm reading as i go uh, recipients have been notified ba, 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 ba. Um, is it wise to get a credit card to build credit or is it easier to avoid was a question from kylie ann um, you know it it depends. I think if you um, are comfortable, again, you don't need to use it on a regular, regular basis, but having it available to you to start to build that footprint, it's one of those catch-22 situations that some people want to avoid credit altogether, but you know, you can't get a job until you have experience, but you can't get experience without a job. Um, to build a credit score and to build, a f to build some kind of um, reputation, you need to start somewhere. So, you know, if it's, there's too much else going on this year, it doesn't have to be right now. You're not any further behind if you get a credit card at 19 and then at 18. Um, but if it's something that you can incorporate and, and feel comfortable handling it, it's not a bad idea at some point in the next four years to start to build your credit a little bit. And again, that can be as simple as, it doesn't have to be a credit card, it can be a, um, a cell phone contract, any of those things. I will say some of the cell phone companies want to know your credit history. So if right now you're on your parents' plan, but in eventually, I hear it's a thing that kids can pay. No, <laughs> my kids are now paying their own. It's very exciting. Um, get your own plan uh, that you might, it might not be a bad idea to start building a little bit of credit as you go. Um, can we repay the entire original balance at the end of the month in order to more to avoid the long-term payment, oh my gosh, yes, that's the whole, <laughs> thank you. That's the whole thing. Um, you know, a credit card is a convenience, so it allows you to go and, you know, it really was meant, it's a very new concept in Canada, but, you know, really it isn't meant to pay for coffees and, um, you know, nail polish, it's meant to, in the day when you were going to buy a couch, you weren't going to carry all that cash to go to the store to and pay for your couch in cash. You'd put it on a credit card and then you'd go to the bank and pay it off. So yes, ideally it's meant to be paid in full every at the end of the month. It's really just a convenient way to pay for all your purchases through the course of a month and then you pay it in full. So absolutely, you can pay it, as I say, before the due date. You can pay it in all kinds of ways, but yeah definitely make the full payment um, and avoid all those, those fees. So um, Anne, yes. Anne, sorry. So again, paying off your credit card in full would also have an impact on your credit score eventually, correct? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. That's so that. not just making the minimum payment, but paying it off in, in full, I would imag imagine would be an advantage to your credit rating. Yes, thank you, because it's all about risk. So they're right. looking at you individually and saying, oh look, she's paying that every month, she's using it responsibly, it goes up, it goes down, it does, it operates the way it's supposed to. So it absolutely has an impact on your credit report, or your credit score, thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, thank you. Calvin asks, didn't Equifax get hacked? Equifax did get hacked. Um, probably about two years now, I have lost all sense of time. Time is a construct at this point, if we have any philosophy students in the group. Um, it did get hacked. I still have a lot of time for Equifax. <laughs> you know, a lot of organizations have been hacked recently. Um, I think they took very quick action in terms of protecting, and it was more in the States, and protecting people's information. And there are ways, which is why it's so important to order your own credit report once every 12 months from both Equifax and TransUnion. Even if you just have one credit card or whatever it is or nothing to make sure that no one's using your information and taking advantage of your credit 
for their own personal gain. So from an identity theft perspective, very important. Um, it isn't just Equifax, right? your life is online now. And there's so many ways people can infiltrate. So you want to be checking your own credit reports once every 12 months. Honestly, the thing that I remember on the exact same day every year is my birthday. So on my birthday, happy birthday to me, I order part of my process other than going to the ice cream store for my free cone. You know, there, oh, and in terms of savings on your birthday, if you Google free stuff on my birthday, a few articles will pop up, um, but you can get a lot of free stuff on your birthday, food particularly. Um, so that's another way to save. So have friends with different birthdays in all different months and you can all treat each other as you go. But um, uh, yeah, making sure that you order that. I order my report on my birthday every year, both from both places, because that's how we go. Um, can international students go about making an informed decision about which Canadian bank to open an account in? That is an excellent question. Thank you very much for that one. There are many options when it comes to what I'm going to say is banking. There are the Canadian banks. There are also a number of credit unions which um, offer all the same services as a bank, but you're not a client, you're a member. You're part of the group. Um, there are also online banks. So, you know, like Tangerine or simply any of these other ones. So it's a very broad um, field at the moment. I think a few things to keep into consideration are um, certainly if you're an international student, which institutions have reciprocal relationships potentially with your bank from home at the moment. So that will just make money transfers um, and foreign exchange and all those kinds of things just a little bit easier. So if you have go to your financial institution um, that you have at home and ask which Canadian banks they deal with, because a lot of them will have relationships. So it might just be easier that way. Um, you also want to make sure that it's a good network. So someplace close and local to the university so that you can go in and do something if you need to do it. Um, there are, I, I would start online looking, um, first of all, the reciprocal relationships, but also check online and see, just check out each of the financial institutions and what they have to say. And they all offer very similar things. The nice thing also about being down at U of T is you are downtown. There are a lot of banks very close. You can go in and ask some questions. Um, the reality is you'll barely go into a bank at this point. Everything is online that you need to do, but it's nice to know, um, especially if you need to do some kind of foreign transaction or uh, wire transfers or any of those things, you've got a place to go to that you feel comfortable. So just go in and ask a lot of questions and they all are located very close to each other. It's a nice little thing about banks. So if you go to one and you don't like the answer, you can go next door or across the street and walk around as you go. Um, and ask friends. I mean, ask if you have other students um, that you know from from home where they bank and are they happy and what kind of uh, accommodations can they offer. And fees. I'm always asking about fees. So questions, uh, awards, where are we going here? Can an international student get student loans from a Canadian bank? So Jillian, do you want to, or Angela, do you want to cover the student loan piece? Because there's a difference between the bank loans and the government loans, right? Well, inter international students are ineligible for OSAP. Right. Um, they would have to defer to their, their mother country to see if their, their country offers any financial assistance to them. So um, unfortunately, um, there, there is no financial support from the banking institution, I don't believe. Um, uh, but you should, but you should refer to your, your mother country. Um, with respect to financial support, um, again, 
the bursary funds that Victoria College has available is specifically designated for domestic students. Now, having said that, when the student, an international student is registered and is here at Victoria College, if they experience an emergency uh, situation that has an impact on their financial uh, situation and there's a shortfall, um, we, we at Victoria College uh, will assess a bursary from the student, the international student, bearing in mind that it is a token amount of money. It, 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 it's not going to prevent you or enable you in any, any way to, it, it's not a make or break deal. Um, uh, with respect to you attending university. So an average bursary for an international student who would meet the criteria may be in the range of zero to $3,000. So, but again, that, that is an emergency, an emergency situation, not something that should be part and parcel of planning your finances. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Julian, do you Can have any? I just any add that um, you know, as a, while you're here as a student, there are opportunities for you to work on campus. We do have a work study program work study. where um, students can, uh, you know, either work at the library or the dining hall, residence hall. Um, and the only thing is that you must first apply for a social insurance number um, through the mm -hmm. Service Canada. So um, there are opportunities here for you to earn money while you're here as a student. Um, so um, there's there's different options for you here, and you can uh, look these up at the, um, the CLNX or Canada, uh, Career and Learning Network uh, website. So uh, uh, clnx.utana.ca. I always wanted one of those on campus jobs. Those are good. <laughs> um, I wanted to be the person who handed out the towels because it looks like they got a lot of studying done. It was not <laughs> just like here, <laughs> I go. Um, a question came in about budgeting resources, and thank you, um, Jillian, you posted the link to the Canada.ca resources. But so here's my little brag moment. Our interactive budget calculator, um, again, you can find that at mymoneycoach.ca. It is a very prettied up Excel sheet, and it gives you pie charts and all kinds of fun things. Um, you can also go to the FCAC, Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, um, they actually, they have one, but it's ours. They licensed it from us. So they liked it so much that they put it up. Um, and it allows you again to save different scenarios and things like that. A great question from Lily and congratulations, Lily. Um, this is a bit of a different one. If your scholarship is more than tuition, can the excess be used for books? Like what, what else can it be used for? So I can answer that. Um, so okay, Lily, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, um, go ahead, Julie. Go ahead. The, um, so, yes, yeah, so students who have a large value um, scholarship, they will be paid out um, later in September um, after students have confirmed to be registered. Um, students uh, whose the tuition amounts are less than um, the scholarship will end up with a credit amount in their ACORN uh, financial account. And um, we highly advise you to set up direct deposit so that you can receive um, a refund for that credit amount. And for sure, definitely you can use the, uh, that credit amount um, for academic costs as, such as textbooks and uh, other maybe uh, lab uh, materials or other things that uh, you need to cover while you're a student here. So um, definitely there's no restrictions on uh, how you spend uh, that money. Obviously there's also commuting costs for students who are traveling to campus from uh, outside the GTA. And so definitely you can use those funds for those purposes. That's great, thank you. Um, there was another, oh, will tuition fees be paid in one big payment or in installments? Jillian, do you sure. want, would, sure. would you like, would you like okay, me to so, answer? Would you want to go ahead? Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, so students, um, after you enroll into courses, um, later in July, you'll get an invoice on your ACORN account and it'll um, show you the minimum payment required to register. So you don't have to pay the huge lump amount um, at the outset. Um, so it's about, I think, 60% of your um, total fees uh, to be paid, I think, by September 2nd. 
and um, the rest can be paid um, later in the year. Uh, but keep in mind that um, there is service charges being, um, uh, will start accruing um, later in, um, in the fall. So um, you should be aware of all those fees deadlines um, at the outset. And I recommend that everyone goes to the fees.utrano.ca website. Um, you see on the uh, fees brochure that we have on the screen, Angela has up here, that um, they'll have all the uh, details for fees, uh, payments, and, um, and deadlines. So just uh, research that before, um, before you start the year. So again, I uh, just just um, echoing uh, what Jillian said, do keep in mind that there is a service charge. You will be charged a service charge like a credit card on the outstanding balance. So although you, you can go ahead and make your minimum payment to allow yourself to get registered, you will be charged, I think, beginning October, um, uh, an interest on the outstanding balance. So be mindful of that. Here's a very smart question. <laughs> Alexander wants to know when we start repaying student loans from OSAP after we start working, is the repayment considered an expense? I.e. will it be considered, is it tax deductible? So Alexander is either American or <laughs> just very savvy. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, in Canada, no, it's not tax deductible. There are, however, as a student, there you do. There are tax benefits, there are tax credits that you will get throughout your schooling. Not as many as there used to be. That textbook credit got taken away, unfortunately. Um, but you do. You'll get a, after sometime in January, early February, in your student system, um, a tax form called a T2202, or it might be a T022. It has twos and zeros in it, I know that. Um, and it will be in the tax documents, and it will confirm how many um, months you have been a confirmed student, and you use that for your taxes. It will give you a tax credit. You may not use it, it may get transferred to your parents if they so wish, or you can carry it forward for the years to come. So when you start working, you can reduce your taxable income that way. So there are some tax advantages to being a student, but deducting your, your loans is not one of them, sadly. Um, when I get a credit card, what should I look out for? Um, and what plan, what should it include and those kinds of things. There uh, is a website called creditcards.ca course, which compares all the different credit cards in Canada. There, I think one, I don't find it necessary to pay for one. Um, if you are using a credit card to build up travel points to be able to go home, you know, a couple of times a year, whatever it is, you know, maybe it's worth it. But you have to look at the different benefits and um, what works for you. So in some cases, that might be a cashback card. In some cases, it might be travel points. In some cases, it might be free groceries or drugstore stuff. You have to look at, um, and I'm assuming U of T has an affinity card with somebody somewhere. Um, there might be different programs and features. So you have to take a look and, and see which one works for you. Um, but beware of, wow, that sounds great. The, if it sounds too good to be true offers, it just might be. So you wanna make sure it's from a reputable institution and it's a pretty standard. And again, you can ask questions and you can give a call to us or to um, go in and ask, just does this look right? And ask people for some their opinions. Um, I think we've covered funding for international students. You've been notified of the rewards, boom, boom. Uh, is there a recommended debit card or credit card? Again, it, it depends on where you're doing your banking um, it, for international students. Um, check what features and what's available to you from the banking, from the institution, whether it's a credit union or the, the bank where you're going to be banking. You want something with some flexibility. If we get an on-campus job as an international student, will we have access to a financial advisor to discuss topics such as paying taxes? in both Canada and native country. 
Um, yes. Um, uh, obviously, um, they, the financial counseling is offered through the registrar's office, um, and they're certainly welcome. The students are welcome to make an appointment to see the financial counselor to, or, or any of the advisors, and we would be happy to, um, to go through the details of their questions with them. Okay. Uh, oh, thank you. And there's also well, the tax sorry, clinic. Give me the link. Sorry, sorry, I was about to give you the link here, but um, our, you, the UTSU, um, the student union offers a tax clinic for the students. The tax clinic, uh, right. So let me just give you that link. I was trying to post that on here for everyone. Those are great, those volunteer tax clinics. Yes. Um, really good because um, Isabel and a few other people have been asking how to access scholarship money. So um, I think her question is in relation to students who have already qualified for an award. Um, so if it's a U of T or VIC award, these will be um, automatically be applied towards tuition in um, the fall once you're confirmed to be registered. So it will first be posted to your ACORN student account um, for, and to have uh, tuition and or residence or other incidental charges be deducted first. And um, if anything is left over, then um, this will be credited or refunded back to you. So you don't have that direct access to the funds. It goes always towards um, outstanding fees first. Fees then shoes. That's right. <laughs> somebody posted something about Sephora and I don't know if that's somebody's name or where the excess scholarship money went, but you know. Um, <laughs> just saying. Uh, I think this might be our last question. You can tell me, Angela, on yes. terms of time. Yes, but, I think um, I'm right. From Maggie, is there an OSAP equivalent for students from other Canadian provinces? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Every province has its own um, student funding. Student funding, yes. So, so they should refer back to their province and, and, and apply through the province, their province. And most of the I terms think, and conditions are the same. I think it looks like that's it, Anne and Julian. Do, do we have any more questions? There was one from way back up here from Shelby, just very quickly. Um, I believe Shelby is a transfer student, not a high school student. Okay. Um, wondering about recommendations where to access bursaries and awards beyond Award Explorer. So I think somebody so just beyond the university boundaries what other programs there are um there's uh someone posted the link i was going to say to scholarships canada oh, scholarships canada yes yeah. yeah which is a great resource um you can put in all your parameters and it tells you the ones that you're eligible for and you know you're not going out these days so take use your extra time and apply for some of the companies um you can also ask, depending on where relatives work, some, it, it's not as common as it used to be, but some companies have scholarship programs. So even if you work at Starbucks, I think you get $500 a semester. Um, if anyone works at Loblaws, a relative, I think it can be an uncle, an aunt, if like that kind of relationship even, um, they have some funding. So asking, you know, this is no shame time, right? Your family and relatives want to support you. So ask anybody if their employer has any programs. Good point. Thank you. Well, I, I think, have we answered everything? And I think we have. I think so.